welcome to What is Black, a parenting podcast that addresses topics important to raising healthy and thriving Black children and teens. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Duje, and today we're going to talk about the new book, Last Gate of the Emperor, with authors Kwame Mbalia and Prince Yoel Makanin. So I'd like to give an overview of our guest today. Kwame Mbalia is a New York Times bestselling author, husband, and father. And Prince Joel Makanin is the great-grandson of His Emperor Majesty, Haile Selassie I, the last emperor of Ethiopia, and an attorney and co-founder of the media and entertainment company, Old World, New World. I had the opportunity to speak to both of these authors separately, but you'll hear their combined responses to the questions about their book, their writing together, so their collaboration, and also the infusion of history into this amazing sci-fi adventure book. So I hope you enjoy the interview. I talked with Kwame Mbalia and asked him if he could give a summary of The Last Gate of the Emperor. Last Gate of the Emperor is a uh, Afrofuturist sci-fi middle grade uh, story that is about a young boy named Yaret who uh, has bounced around school to school, city to city. He and, and his uncle and his uh, intrepid bionic lioness, Besa, who only he can understand, um, as you do. And um, he, you know, his uncle has always told him these stories of, you know, from their culture, and he's listened to them, and uh, they've always been ingrained in him. Um, but he's always treated them as stories until one day when he's playing his very favorite, awesome, fantastic video game, The Hunt for Caleb's Obelisk, uh, he puts his name, his real name, into the login and triggers an incredible reaction. And some of the stories that he just took for granted start uh, becoming real. And so it's really, um, it's an adventure, you know, it's a romp through sci-fi, through, you know, inspired Ethiopian settings. Um, But it's really a story about finding out who you really are and who you're really meant to be and if destiny is really ordained by fate or if you have a choice. So as you heard, Kwame provided a summary of the book. As a follow-up question, I asked Yoel if he could talk a little bit more about his connection with the book, given the historical context of the book being set in Ethiopia and his connections to Ethiopia. It's based on real people and places. So there's references as far back as the Queen of Sheba and her story of how she was this um, uh, Ethiopian queen and started a line that basically, uh, a royal line that uh, ruled Ethiopia for the next 3,000 years, all the way up to my great-grandfather, who's Emperor Haile Selassie. He was the last emperor of Ethiopia. And so the arc of our protagonist, uh, uh, Yared, is the the story of a young boy who is separated um, from his history and his roots. And basically the adventure he launches on is is a path of self-discovery and discovering his history and his roots. And that's very personal to me because I grew up as a prince in exile in the West. And so I was separated from my home country and my family and and it wasn't easy. and it's only throughout the years that I had these mentors around me, um, my uncles and my grandfather, who would tell me the, this history of Ethiopia and the, and the great heritage that I had. But it was very disconnect because I was living in, in Europe and um, I was a prince, but I was wondering where all of the, the great material benefits were. And they weren't there at the time. My family was just trying to start a new life uh, because there was a communist revolution that happened in Ethiopia. So we couldn't really go back. And so my journey, I think, is actually relatable, even though it's a very unique story. I think every child at, at that age, around 10 to 12, um, is on in those formative years, is trying to make sense of their identity and who they are. And that's really the message that I want to convey in this book is I want kids to go on their own journey of self-discovery. And I encourage them and, and I hope Last Gate of the Emperor will motivate them to do that and that they will find out that there's so much power in your own story. The 
one thing that really struck me in the conversation with both Yoel and Kwame was this idea of the power of story. So I asked them, what is the power of story and what does that mean to them? The power of story uh, is, I mean, you know, apart from first is the power of Almighty God. But uh, beyond that, the story is, is the most biggest and powerful uh, force in humanity. Uh, and the reason why is because it, it, it drives and aims to answer the question, why? We have so many questions about why. Why are we here? Why are we in this planet? What, you know, what's my life meaning about? And um, stories are really what motivates human life uh, all through, you know, countries deciding to, to partner or go to war at each other. Uh, young children finding a, a role model that they aspire to, to becoming a, maybe a scientist or, or a, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or, or, or be like their teacher. Um, the, the, the story that we tell ourselves throughout our lives basically determines uh, our, our trajectory. And I think that especially young children, um, that um, quest for the story and making sense of the world um, is, is so important. And that's why we need to write these stories. That's why uh, it's, it's so fortunate that we have all these diverse stories because everybody needs to find the one that, that works for them, um, to empower them, to make sense of the world. And because story is the vehicle through which we convey certain truths about life. Story, it's, it's, story is, is possibility, Right. Um, when you create a story, um, you are putting a vision, an idea, and a dream in someone's head, the reader's head, right? Um, or, you know, the listener's ears, however the story is communicated. And that vision then becomes one possibility, even if it's fantasy, right? It becomes, uh, we become familiar with these characters, it becomes an, an outlet, it becomes uh, a receptacle for our imagination, which in and of itself is a beautiful thing because our imagination needs to be stretched and worked as, uh, as much as any muscle in our body. Um, but it also, especially in sci-fi, it almost becomes a blueprint, right? It becomes something that we aspire towards. Uh, and so when you read a story that, again, and, and I'm going to keep you know, belaboring this point, when you read a story that has you know, bountiful, beautiful, diasporan, uh, peoples in it in the future you recognize that you know or, or your subconscious may recognize that as a possibility we exist in the future and when you see your culture displayed in the future you begin to aspire towards that you know you begin to if, you, if there's a, a, a if you see a video game and it amazes you even if it's pretend even if it's you know uh, uh, only exists within this story you see that and it begins to open up another pathway in your brain like this this is a possibility. We can have a game uh, completely suffused in Ethiopian culture uh, as a part of, of uh, in the future, something that I can play. I would love to be able to play that. That's something, you know, it's a whole nother conversation about where do we uh, and where do marginalized communities exist in the video game spectrum. Uh, but it then becomes a possibility. And so that's, that's, Really, the answer right there is stories are possibilities. And as we tell more stories, more diverse stories, um, the possibilities for all of us to move forward into the future with empathy and understanding, it just becomes that much greater. Kwame Mbalia is the author of Tristan Strong, which is another sci-fi adventure book. And I know that he really loves writing about science fiction. So I asked him to talk a little bit more about his love of science fiction. Absolutely. Um, I, I am a science fiction and fantasy nerd aficionado. Um, it's just ingrained in me. Um, science fiction is... Um, well, let, let me back up. Fantasy is great because fantasy, you get to create your own worlds, right? and imagine systems and, you know, ecosystems and ecology and uh, all sorts of different, you know, beings and stuff that uh, this world might have, right? But whereas in science fiction, you get to imagine 
our world, but even better, right? Like it's slightly, it's grounded in reality as much as possible, even if it's extrapolated all the way out to, you know, a galaxy far, far away, right? Um, and so, yeah, I grew up uh, reading a lot of sci-fi um, and just uh, believing that, um, which is, you know, really the power of, of books in general, but in, in sci-fi books especially, well, just believing in the power of the future and what we can do to get there. You know, like everyone, you know, uh, um, or I shouldn't say everyone, but we remember, you know, the Jetsons, that old that old cartoon, and, you know, everyone would be flying. Or even uh, uh, Back to the Future 2, I believe, where they had the hoverboards and everything. And you're like, oh, man, in 2000, everything is going to be incredible. It's going to be great. Uh, or or uh, Blade Runner, where it's like, oh, in 2019, this is going to happen. Like, even though it didn't come to pass, imagining what is possible in our future with the technology and, and, and just, you know, thinking about uh, uh, what is po- what could be possible, you know, where we'd be, where we might be as, as humanity um, in, the, in this world, in the new future, how we can make it better. Uh, it's just, I mean, I don't know how you could not love sci-fi. And yes, you know, there's what they call hard sci-fi and light sci-fi, but I just, I'm in love with the genre because we get to devise mechanisms for just making this future, the future that we want possible. That's a fantastic question. And one I think should be asked of every, you know, media uh, outlet, every technology, whether, you know, you're talking about video games, or you're talking about books, comic books, graphic novels, uh, audio books, whether you're talking about TV shows or movies. This idea that um, uh, if you took a snapshot, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, even, you know, you would ask, you would ask, or you would be, you know, uh, um, you would be validated in asking, do we exist in the future? Because we don't see it, right? Like uh, we cling to our Jordy LaForges and and uh, um, our, our uh, Worf's, you know, because, you know, Worf was coded as black. I don't care what you say. Uh, we, we cling to our few instances of representation because we are hungry for the knowledge that we exist in the future. And so writing a book like Last Gate of the Emperor, where we not only exist in the future, the diaspora is in the future, and we have inspired technology that has powered our, you know, flight throughout the stars and across the galaxy, uh, is something that's not only uh, necessary, but imperative. Like, uh, we, as in the, the, um, the, the grown-ups, the adults, the uh, ones that are responsible for showing the future to, you know, the younger generations, we have a responsibility um, of, of doubling, redoubling our efforts to portray those futures with them in it, with ourselves in it. Um, and Afrofuturism, you know, I love to think of it as the this melding of um, technology and culture, specifically African, African American, or just diaspora culture with technology and doing that, you just, I mean, it's already being done. Like when, when, when you, when you're writing sci-fi or when you're watching a sci-fi show, someone's culture is being melded with technology. The problem is it's being coded as the default, right? Like this is the default future. And then we have to create a label like Afrofuturism to designate that, hey, no, we also exist in the future and our culture also exists in the future, right? And so it is imperative upon us, um, whether we're intending to create, you know, a, a book with a message or whether we're just creating entertainment, it is imperative that we display to those younger generations that you exist in the future, you have a future, and it is as wide and diverse and vast as you can imagine. As co-authors from different backgrounds, I wanted to also know how they work together and what their writing process was in order to create this book. We have a lot of things in common, including that, you know, we're both Harvard graduates. And, um, but more importantly, we both grew up um, on, on different parts of the planet, but uh, in, a, in a similar environment where the stories about Africa and African history were very uh, permeate. All, all uh, our lives, uh, you know, we grew up with them. And, and I know Kwame uh, will speak to that too, that in his family, it was very important to be very steeped in African history. So we loved uh, uh, the, this mission that we, you know, set to 
to go on together about telling powerful stories based in Africa, you know, talking about the real history and, and kind of, you know, elements of Africa, I mean, elements of Ethiopia, especially with the lion being kind of our symbol. And what was beautiful about that is that then, you know, Kwame was off to the races because this, this is his uh, really an area where he's just so good. It's, it's kind of bringing all of that into level of a middle grade story for young children. And so, I mean, it was really amazing how quickly we were both um, uh, moving and writing and he's super quick. I'm pretty quick. And I think that it, it, it was just this kind of love that for, for the story that we were building. And I think I have to give him a lot of the credit for the setting into the sci-fi setting and, and um, getting so much detail into even like augmented reality games. Um, I know that I wanted it always to have a strong Ethiopian and African culture element. So I think that's what I brought in and really the, the real world setting, uh, the real history behind it. Uh, but I know he's a huge uh, video game fan, so he brought all of those elements and all of that fun, uh, wisecracking jokes that uh, I feel like um, were just, you know, so fitting, um, given that this this is the world he like he, he loves to speak to. And it was really, a, a, you know, like I, I think we talked earlier about serendipity. Um, and I feel like it was really fate that brought us together and, and it was a, a perfect collaboration. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, a bidirectional um, uh, effort and, and activity, right? Like the one thing that you want to do is you want to create a plot and a story that is um, adventurous, that is emotional, that has you know twists and turns and curves, and un it's unpredictable at points. But it's a great story, right? Uh, but then, just like I said, you also want to infuse it. Um, with the with this culture, with these characters, um, with this worldview uh, that represents not only uh, one subset of cultures, but a diaspora, which is something that I try to do in, in, in all of my writing. And so working with Yoel, I mean, it was really a dream come true because Yoel, you know, I'm not Ethiopian. And so uh, as someone who is, is quote unquote writing outside of my lane, having someone like Yoel to bounce ideas off of, to contribute to add suggestions, to uh, inform me about the different, you know, Ethiopia is not a monolith, uh, um, as is want to be said about a lot of uh, different uh, Black cultures. Uh, Ethiopia is not a monolith. And so to have him inform me about the different subcultures within that makes up this united Ethiopia is uh, was invaluable. I then wanted to learn from each of the authors, what were their favorite sections of the book? So you'll hear both Kwame and Yoel give their responses to this question. So I'll read you a passage that I really love because um, it, it, it lays the, the ground for our readers to understand the world that they're entering. Um, and it's right at the beginning of the book. Okay, so it starts like this. Once there was an empire that stretched across the galaxy, great, noble, wardens of peace and good fortune. They spread wealth and technology throughout the stars. This empire was called Aksum. When Aksumite ships landed in a new star system and made contact with the residents, they offered to teach them, to bring them into the empire, sharing their knowledge and power. That was how their empire continued to grow. All sentient races and species were invited, and though some did refuse, many accepted. And of those who accepted entry into the empire, there was one that grew jealous. These people coveted Axum's technology, for they came from a barren planet whose resources had been exhausted, and they longed to take the stars to find new riches to exploit. But they didn't want to share. They wanted to rule. They were called the Waratis. The Warari bided their time, waiting until Aksum was distracted with the emperor and empress's new baby, and then they struck. Using stolen Aksumite technology, they conquered one peaceful planet after another. Planets, space stations, asteroid colonies. The Warari enslaved them all, then continued across the galaxy like unstoppable conquerors. And to help, they unleashed a terrible monster, a creature of such hatred and violence, none can stand in its way. Its name was the Bulgu. But the emperor and empress of Aksum fought back. 
their bodyguards were the legendary Mashanitai, unparalleled warriors who wielded curved shotels wreathed in black flame. The Mashanitai were fierce. They fought like demons with incredible speed and power. The Aksumite army, the living flames of the burning legend, defended their nation until the bitter end. And it was a bitter end. Just when it looked like Aksum would prevail, a traitor, someone known and loved by the royal family, robbed them of their source of strength, the power that let the mighty nation travel between the stars. I love this part because it sets the stage. And of course, it's set in a fantastical world and, and sci-fi and, you know, just the compelling adventure of it all. Um, but I also love how it gives a parallel um, to real world history. And that's what I want to share with you today is that um, this is um, a story that, of course, drives the, the plot of Last Gate of the Emperor. But in Ethiopia, it was also a, a story that we had time and again of of. Uh, other nations or neighboring or for far, far coming from far away, wanting to invade and, and exploit the resources of Ethiopia, just like many other African countries. Um, but the, really the, the, the power of our history is that we always fought would be invaders. And Ethiopia had this great uh, national identity and national history that always allowed people to unite to fight off would be invaders. And in this particular case, it's also meant to give a little bit of a parallel of the most recent one, which was Italy trying to invade and colonize Ethiopia, and we fought them back. And so that's something we're really proud of, and I'm, I'm really excited to weave it into this history so that I actually hope young readers, once they're finished reading Last Gate of the Emperor, that it will spark their curiosity and that they'll want to go and find out even more on their own. And they'll find out that all these very powerful stories, even though it's set in a sci-fi fantasy world, they're actually anchored in, in, in real life history. So I hope they'll be excited about that. I think my favorite section, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a sucker for emotion. Um, if a book can, or a movie or, or anything can make me cry, I'm like, yes, five out of five. That is great. I love it. Um, because it, 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 it means that it affected some core part of yourself. And, you know, you can't, can't really grow as a person until that core part of you has been affected in some manner, or been changed or impacted. Um, and so in the book there, I, I can't reveal too much because there are spoilers, but our intrepid hero, Yared, um, discovers someone that he's been looking for his whole life, right? And and figures out that they, um, he figures out some truths about himself and his life and in, in conversation with this person, and he asks them a question that has been haunting him, that he hasn't realized has been haunting him his whole life, but that was necessary for him to learn the answer to if he was going to proceed and become this person that he's supposed to become. And, and so it's a pivotal moment. And the answer, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those questions where you really don't want to hear the answer to because there's no right, there's no good answer. But in learning it, it sets him on his path of understanding. And I mean, I cried. I cried when when uh, when we were writing it, um, and I still tear up reading it because if you learn, if if you learn, you know, some fundamental truth about yourself, no matter how much it hurts, um, and it makes you a better person, then that truth was necessary. And I say that because you know, as we talk about. Uh, um, America uh, dealing and grappling with its history and the way that it's treated uh, marginalized peoples, you know, along the way, until we grapple with our hurt, we cannot grow into who we're supposed to be, whether you're a person or a nation. And so I think that is probably my favorite part in the book. And it comes, I, w- I want to say maybe 70, 75% of the way through the book, which is why I'm being really vague because it could be a spoiler. And then lastly, what I've been asking all my guests on this season is, how can we reimagine the world for Black children and youth? And I asked each of them what they would reimagine or how they would reimagine the world to better support Black children and youth. You know, I, I want to reimagine a world for Black children where they have at their disposal and access, have access to more stories 
of more powerful stories and 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 in in a few words i would say better narratives uh and what i mean by that is back to my point about the single story i i think if we're overwhelmed with one aspect of black experience as a child you you know consciously or subconsciously kind of absorb it and adopt it and um i think that moving forward uh definitely with last gate of the emperor and i'm hoping others i know that um you know, Tomi Adeyemi has a great series uh, with a, a strong um, uh, Black uh, African lead female as well uh, in the Children of Blood and Bone uh, series. Um, and I'm hoping, and, and, and Tristan Strong, and I know that uh, I was on a panel with uh, B.B. Alston too, with uh, Amari and the Knight Brothers. I just want children to have all these number of different stories that they can relate to and find the one that will inspire them and, and propel them. Because... Um, the Black story, un unfortunately, especially, I think a, a big part of it comes from the portrayal of Africa. And unfortunately, it's been really uh, badly portrayed, in my opinion, um, you know, always uh, labeled with, you know, the, the Black, the dark cart, the dark continent, or, you know, the fact that there's, uh, you know, always war or disease and famines. And not to say that th those things haven't happened. Of course, they, they have. Uh, and then it's a problem and they have to be addressed. But those things have happened everywhere in the world. Uh, and it's not fair that Africa gets labeled with that only when we are a place of great history, great culture. We have made so many contributions to um, from the, the, the beginning of times, you know, um, f to, to literature, science, trade, uh, all of these things. And I think that's what's important is that once um, and, and that's the area I, I know I can tackle is improving the narrative for Africa will improve the narrative for all black people around the world. Um, and especially Black children and, and youth need to have access to these stories. And, you know, I'm talking about a variety. Of course, ours is a sci-fi fantasy hero uh, who, you know, aims to save the world and his country, uh, but also stories about uh, young Black and queer or um, young um, um, uh, female characters, that uh, strong female characters. Um, maybe stories about, you know, um, a young kid who loves skateboard. You know, all of these things have not been asso have been associated, uh, not been associated with Black people where we're actually, you know, we're not a monolith. You know that, uh, Jackie. Uh, I'm sure that you battle with that too. Um, but definitely a world where they can have all of these stories so that they're inspired and that people can give us kind of the, the due respect we, we, we deserve and also recognize the contributions we've made to the world and that we will continue to make. It's such a tough and almost overwhelming task that you kind of have to think of it as, you know, in a step-by-step -step term. And I, I like to think that in some aspects I'm contributing by trying to bring awareness to uh, when we infuse the stories with history, bringing awareness to that history that many people might have either not received or ignored or not deemed as important, um, specifically, you know, Black American history and, and, and so forth. But um, we... There's, I don't even know where to begin. We, there's a fundamental um, flaw within our society in that how it was founded um, on backs of uh, indigenous uh, and, and, and uh, people of color, indigenous peoples and people of color, and how it used and discarded them, and you, you know, and and pretty much, you know, ground them up. Uh, and use their mortar to really uh, use them as mortar to really build up the foundation of this nation. And so it's, it's part of the reason why you see such a hesitation by many um, to make a change because to make a change would mean you have to change that foundation and they're afraid of seeing what has been built crumble. But, you know, we're, we're living really in a haunted house full of specters of, of ghosts of the past. Um, and, one of the, I mean, to offer a concrete example, we have to start really with our education system and what we are teaching and what we are learning, uh, because there are whole swaths of um, history that have just been blatantly ignored. And and I, I say this often, and it's because it's the most recent uh, pop culture example that's fresh in everyone's mind. But two major pieces of Black American history were learned in 2020 um, through HBO. 
And that is, you know, uh, the recent series Watchmen when they touched on the Tulsa Massacre. And then the, the even more recent series Lovecraft Country when they talked about sundown towns. Uh, you had entire, um, you know, the internet was going bananas. You know, what's sundown town? As people realized that they had been living in communities that excluded uh, people of color, uh, specifically black Americans, uh, from living from within their walls after sunset, right? Um, or the Tulsa massacre, where an entire community was raised. Um, uh, and and I mean, that's that's what that's a gener- two generations ago. That is uh, uh, directly impacts the people uh, living today and what they can and cannot do. You know, you talk about the terms of generational wealth and, and things like that. Um, you cannot build wealth if you don't have the opportunity. And so I just think, you know, it all stems from our education system. And so as we take granular steps and try to, you know, bring change within the system and outside of the system, that's where it all has to start. We have to first learn what has happened before we can begin to change it. Well, that's all for today's episode of What is Black. Thank you for listening and thank you to our guests, authors Kwame Mbalia and Prince Joel Makane. I think you're going to love The Last Gate of the Emperor. I learned so much from reading the book, even though it's a fictional book. There's so much rich history infused in the book. So I think you'll love it. I, I know I did. Music and editing for this episode was completed by Manny Simone. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. And to stay up to date, sign up for our newsletter at whatisblack.co. Until next time.